Hello, good morning. Today our guest is Professor Orlando Patterson, and we're going to be talking about his classic book, The Sociology of Slavery. This book was published in 1967, and it still remains a key text for students and historians of slavery. Professor Patterson, I read your new introduction, but many of our listeners are yet to read it. So could you please tell us a little about your motivation for writing the new introduction? Sure. And thanks for having me on your show again. Um, it's been many years, well over half a century since the book was published. So one of my first uh, goals was to discuss writings on that subject, the subject of slavery in Jamaica, since the publication. And um, there have been many, but the important thing to note is that the sociology of slavery, black society in Jamaica, 1655 to 1838, was the first book to explore the life and culture of the slaves on Jamaica, but also just as importantly, it's the first book in English to be entirely devoted to the study of the life and culture of the slaves. That sounds like a tall claim. And I was a little bit surprised at first uh, when one or two people had mentioned this, but um, it turned out to be the case. Now there are many books written on slavery before the sociology of slavery, numerous books. Uh, many of course in Portuguese like Gilberto Ferrer's classic, The Masters and the Slaves and so on. Uh, but this, a, a book entirely devoted to the study of the life and culture and experience slaves, uh, there's been no previous book in English. Um, now you may think, what about the, the, the great black historians, many of whom influence me, like W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois wrote a lot on slavery, but his classic, his, his PhD was on the African slave, the ab abolition of the African slave trade. He wrote a lot about the influence of slavery. And of course his classic book, Black Reconstruction is one of the masterpieces of um, a study of um, related to slavery, but it was on reconstruction, that is the period of America um, in which they tried to um, uh, somewhat rectify the problems of slavery in America. And in fact, it was one of the most liberal events in American political history, but it wasn't on slavery, although he had a lot to say about the lives of slaves. The book was primarily about the reconstruction era, the political and administrative and other factors. Uh, other histories have been written in which you may have one, two or so chapters. And then of course there's um, uh, the, the classic studies um, uh, by U.B. Phillips on slavery in the South. But that book was again on general, the general society about white society and so on in which a chapter was on the slaves. Kenneth Stamp's book comes closest to what the sociology of slavery attempted in, in English. Uh, that work, of course, was the great revisionist work which um, criticized severely the previously classic work by U.B. Phillips. And, um, but even so, it was on the general nature of the society with about a third of the book uh, discussing aspects of slave life. That's the closest anyone came to doing what I did in the sociology of slavery, which was to write a book completely devoted to the life and culture of the slaves. Now, others came afterwards uh, the first to come after this was um, uh, Kamau Brathwaite, then known as Edward Brathwaite's book, The Development of Creole Society in Jamaica. But it's important to note 
that Brathwaite's book was a general study and only about less than 40% of the book uh, was devoted to the life and culture of the slaves. Um, I think Brathwaite was a little concerned about that later on and he later on wrote something called the, the Life of the Slaves, um, which was based on the chapters in the book, The Development of Creole Society Devoted to Slavery. But um, that work, which is often cited, the development of Creole society was primarily um, a, a book that I call a dominion study, a study of the overall society, not devoted completely to the lives of the slaves. So that's the significance. It's um, one of the um, important uh, contributions of the sociology of slavery. It is not only the first book on Jamaica and Jamaican slaves, their lives, their psychology, their domestic economy, their resistance. The very first book on Jamaica, but the very first book in the English language, which was entirely devoted to the study. And um, it had a significant impact. I think numerous studies came after that, both in America and in the Caribbean. And I discussed the historiography, that is say the studies of, um, slavery and Jamaica afterward. I, I reviewed all the many studies that came uh, afterward. Now, um, so that that's one of the things that the introduction did. And so any scholar now approaching the subject will find that that part of the introduction very useful. The second thing the introduction did was to, um, say something about my own background as I approached the study of uh, slavery in Jamaica. Uh, what motivated me to do this and um, uh, where I did this in Britain uh, as my dissertation and um, the people who influenced me in doing this, Eric Williams, of course, but even more so C.L.R. James, who had previously written one uh, classic work uh, on the revolt of the slaves. And in a way, one could see James's study, The Black Jacobins, uh, as, if you like, the, the closest thing to a study of the life um, of the slaves, although it's focused, of course, on the, uh, re the Great Revolution and um, the ways in which um, it related to uh, French ideas of um, freedom and the fact that um, that um, great revolution was uh, led to the second independent uh, movement in the hemisphere. And James was concerned with, you know, his role in the history of freedom and so on. And uh, in the course of doing that, he sort of referred to aspects of slave life, but that work was not primarily focused on in detail on the life, the culture, the, the sociology, the resistance. Uh, well, this was concerned primarily with the resistance, but I'd say the cultural psychology, um, the relationships uh, among the slaves, in other words, slave life. And, um, uh, but James greatly influenced me as did, um, as is Williams. Now Williams classic study, as you know, um, on slavery was on the economics uh, and, and, and political aspects of slavery as it relates to um, British capitalism. And um, uh, uh, Williams also wrote uh, a short um, book on um, black life um, generally, um, which was very important. So those were great influences. So I discussed the influences on um, me. And, um, and then perhaps the, sec the, the, the part of the introduction, the introduction is almost 60 pages, by the way. Um, the part of the introduction, which will be of greatest interest to Jamaicans now, uh, especially non-academics. I think academics will be very interested in my review of um, the historiography since um, the, the publication of this book, which was, by the way, published in 1967 in Britain and in 1969 in the US. Um, 
the most relevant part of the book for the, um, the layman, if you like, and um, uh, intellectual interested um, in knowing something about slavery and its consequences for Jamaica. I looked, I used um, data that was not available when I wrote The Sociology of Slavery. I used, uh, one of the chapters of the book was concerned with the tribal origins of the Jamaican slaves. What part of Africa they came from, because I was interested in not only their roots in Africa demographically, but also the cultural influences, which, um, uh, which, which you know, what were the origins uh, of um, Jamaican um, African uh, Professor Patterson? I'm actually yeah. getting to that question soon. So yeah. I have that question on the list. But since you have already started the debate, I recently wrote an article on Jamaican Barbados and your piece that was published in 2014, criticizing the AGR thesis. Well, you weren't criticizing the AGR thesis. You are criticizing the anti-institutionalist school applying the AGR model. So I read that article some years ago and I wrote a similar article for laymen using some of your ideas. And in my piece, I compared the composition of Barbados with that of Jamaica. There are some academics who argue that the Igbo cultural imprint in Barbados is greater. What's your view on that issue? You know, that's a difficult- um, It is. To um, assess. I think, um, and I don't, you know, I don't want to um, um, say anything definitive about this. Um, what I do know is uh, I can speak about Jamaica. So let me say this: um, it depends on whether you're talking about the demographic influence or the cultural influence. Now, the two often go together, but not necessarily. And in the case of Jamaica, it's somewhat complex. So here's the situation. Uh, overall, there's no doubt that this, the group this, um, which contributed most demographically to Jamaica uh, were people, the Igbo and the Ibibio speaking peoples of, um, of Nigeria, Southeastern Nigeria, I, um, Igbos and related peoples. Um, and that's now being borne out by the um, the DNA studies, for example, I myself did um, the ancestry.com uh, tests, and uh, I had always thought that um, my African background was mainly um, uh, from Ghana. The, the three speaking peoples, the Ashanti and the Fanti, and so on. But um, and, and I'll explain to you why I thought that in a minute. But it turns out that most of my African ancestry, almost two thirds were from Southeastern Nigeria, Igbo, um, Igbo speaking peoples. Now, here's the situation. Um, the, uh, it depends on what period of Jamaica you're talking about. So in the earliest period, starting 1655, we don't go beyond that because before that was the Spanish and the Spanish influence was minor, just slavery and the whole society is very small and so on. So starting 1655, up to about 1720 or so, the single greatest group were from what's now Ghana, then called the Gold Coast. They were known collectively at the time as the Coromantes. And um, the, the, um, that group, became very important. And they constitute the majority, by the way, of the group we know as the Maroons and the Maroon Wars. And it makes sense demographically. They were the dominant group demographically and culturally. Now, their influence culturally became very strong. Uh, and I'll explain why later. But starting about 1720 or so, the increasingly, the groups were coming from what's now um, southeastern Nigeria and I other Biafra. Yeah, Biafra, Biafra. Yeah, uh, but we know now from the DNA data and from the more recent 
um, work from the Atlantic slave trade uh, database, which is one of the great developments, the major developments in um, the study of um, black history, Atlantic history, uh, which came after my study. Now we know now that increasingly the numbers were from, um, let's use the modern terminology, it turns out the Bite of Biafra and so on refers to a large area, but primarily Southeastern uh, um, Nigeria. And they became the dominant group until about the end of the 18th century, when increasing numbers came from what's now Ang Angola and the Congo, okay? Now, that's the situation. However, in terms of cultural history, often the groups that come first tend to have, if you like, a head start in determining um, the overall influence. And that is why groups from Ghana, known as Coromantes, people like from Ashanti, the Fanti, and so on, uh, belong to the family of languages, African languages known as Twi, T-W-I. Fanti, Ashanti, the most famous. Um, they had a head start and therefore their influence remained very powerful, even though in demographic terms, their numbers um, are relatively much, much less than people from Nigeria, Southern Nigeria. And um, but taking overall, there are no more than about uh, a third, uh, maximum 40% of all the Africans who came to Jamaica. Whereas the um, people from the Igbo speaking um, part of Nigeria were by far the greatest number, almost a half, if not more, okay? But their influence wasn't as powerful as the, um, as the Ghanaian. Now, to get to your Barbados question, uh, it may well be that um, the Barbadians did not have as many people, although I rather doubt this, in the early period um, um, from Ghana as from um, uh, Nigeria. I, um, we can actually check this out with the Atlantic slave trade database. And so, you know, I, I could answer that question later on. I don't have the data in front of me immediately, but you know, it's a, I wouldn't go as far as saying that, you know, the Igbo influence is stronger. Um, although you, you might say that perhaps the Ghanaian, the tree speaking people or Akan speaking, which is a subfamily of tree, uh, which includes Fanti uh, and Ashanti, uh, may have been more powerful in Jamaica than in Barbados. And they certainly um, were at the heart of most of the slave revolts in Jamaica were led by people from Ghana right up to uh, about 1780. Okay, <laughs> so that's All a right. long, long answer to a complicated well, um, I, I, uh, I know that Michael Deason and his co-authors, they agree with your argument that many of the states were, many, sorry, not, not states, many of the slaves were taken from Igbo communities, but their argument was that the Bight of Biafra was really a place where you could procure slaves, and many of the slaves that were procured from the Bight of Biafra were actually from the Gold Coast. So most yeah. ja Jamaicans are from the Gold Coast. Um, that is not correct. When you say most of Jamaica, um, uh, uh, we come from many different regions, but so I'd say the single greatest number, uh, uh, the group which, uh, in demographic terms, which contributed the, the, the single greatest numbers were from Southeastern Nigeria. That's no clear because I've gone through that data. In fact, I presented a table in my um, introduction, which brought up to date. So if you want the most up to date figures on this, look at the table in the introduction, which shows you exactly the numbers and proportions that came over at different periods. It's important that you emphasize the particular period. Uh, uh, you can talk about what was the most significant um, group in demographic terms overall in the entire 133 years. Or you can ask, well, what is the dominant group in particular period? 
And the reason why that specification is important is that groups that came earlier had more powerful influence. It's, it stands to reason they, they, had a, they had a head start in, in setting up, establishing the Creole culture. And that's demonstrated in the um, linguistic evidence. And we have very good studies on um, Jamaican Creole by LePage and Cassidy and so on. And they were in fact the first to observe that Jamaican Creole is disproportionately influenced by people from Ghana. And um, that is Fanti, uh, Ashanti, uh, Sri speaking uh, people. That, uh, and they also noted, however, that that was because when the Creole language, um, uh, what used to be called Pidgin or Patois, but which is properly called Creole because it is a complete language with its own grammar and so on, that when that language was being established, the group that was dominant then were people from Ghana, Coromanti, uh, even though demographically in terms of the numbers, they became less and less later on. Um, so they had a head start on the Igbo speaking peoples. There is Igbo, uh, uh, there are Igbo words in the Jamaican uh, Creole, but really as the, the substantial uh, um, influence, uh, the dominant influence is Ghana. You see it in words like, you know, the day names, um, Kwashi, Kwashibo. They, they, um, in Ghana, you had um, this tradition of naming children after the days in which they were born. And Kwashi and Kwashibo, Kwashiba, um, were the names for, for Sunday. And Kojo uh, is another day name and so on. Uh, but that influence is due to the fact that they came earlier. So that I keep emphasizing this the point. When you're talking about influence, you have to specify the period at which they came. So the overall situation is that the majority of us Jamaicans, uh, well, the single greatest um, numbers came from um, Southeastern Nigeria, um, but the single greatest influence was from Ghana. And, um, and that not only linguistically and culturally, but also politically in the sense that almost all the major slave revolts were led by slaves from Ghana. And that would lead you to think that their demographic influence continued right through. In fact, their cultural influence continued through. And the fact that they, well, what is true of the rebellion is true of the culture. The fact that they were among the earliest group to, to form, to, to, to start the rebellions and then form the, um, you know, the, the maroon communities. Then of course, there's a powerful motivating factor for um, groups that came later on from Ghana because they would say, you know, look, these are my brothers up there in the hills. Uh, I'm going to revolt too. So they had a very strong demonstration effect on later um, slave revolts. But in purely demographic terms, in terms of numbers, the Igbos overtook them uh, by about 1740. And then right through for most of the 18th century to repeat until about 1790, 70, uh, 18, uh, 1800, when another group became very important because by, by then, we're moving now towards the end of the slave trade. In those last decade, uh, they had pretty well exhausted the, um, the traditional sources uh, and um, new sources came on the market. Uh, in Nigeria, the dominant source became the Yorubas. And the Yorubas didn't contribute much early because they were a powerful group, imperial group, they had their own empire. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, and then, uh, but then the empire collapsed uh, just about when the slave trade was ending and when Cuba started to rise. And that is why um, so many of the slaves in Cuba um, were of um, Yoruba ancestry, unlike Jamaica. However, another group started coming in towards the last decades of the 18th century. And that was a group from um, South Central Africa, primarily Angola, and Congo, okay? <laughs> it's a complicated story, what a fascinating one. All right, so Professor Patterson, 
I've read many of your articles. So we, we know it, you're a well-read man. So I'm going to ask you this question. How seriously do you take cultural anthropology? And I'm asking this question because surveying the data and reading books like yours and extrapolating data from other studies, some would argue that in Barbados, there was a selection for the Igbo personality type. So when I'm <laughs> doing, I, I, yes, that's, I, I'm, I'm kind of go, going in that direction. So when I'm doing academic research, I do find that the Igbos, like people of African descent, are, collecti are collectivistic, but they're more individualistic. So James Robinson and his co-author, yeah. they have a new paper. And in this paper, they examine the Igbo culture, the English culture, Confucianism and other cultures, and they argue that the Igbo culture is more fluid. This is not to suggest that fluid cultures are better yeah. than hardwired cultures, but yeah. there's an argument that long-term orientation, yeah. individualism, and materialism yeah. are terms you usually see when you're researching the Igbo people. So because slavery in Barbados was so brutal, and in order to survive, the slaves had to comply with regulations, yeah. there was a cultural selection for the Igbo personality profile. Okay, that's an interesting argument. Okay, and I like the way you pose it because um, you're asking how important culture is in determining um, behavior. I have to think culture is very important. There's a movement against explaining things in, um, in cultural terms. Uh, one reason why, and, and people who do that are often castigated as being conservative, which is ridiculous. Um, why, why I think that culture in, in uh, interaction with structural economic forces um, best explains outcome. So culture is important. It's not, I wouldn't explain behavior entirely in terms of culture, but I certainly think that motivation, values, norms, um, uh, what Bourdieu uh, would call the habitus of um, a people uh, is important. So, um, I think it's a very intriguing idea. As you know, I didn't draw on that argument in explaining the relative success of Barbadians compared to Jamaicans, but it's an interesting one. I'm not going to dismiss it. I'm always open to, to ideas. I'm now, going to send you the paper then. Yeah, sure. But I do know this, that quite a few people have argued that um, Igbo, uh, this particular Igbo, I mean, the Igbo speaking peoples are of many different groups, but um, there's the Ibibios and there are the Igbos and so on. They're all related uh, in South, um, Southeastern Nigeria. And they're the ones, by the way, who try to form their, to break away from Nigeria to form their own state, uh, which they call, uh, you know, Biafra. Um, the, the revolt was brutally put down, um, so it didn't succeed. But um, that the argument has been made that you know they have a, a high degree of um, individualism and entrepreneurship. Sort of, um, they're more so um, of all the African peoples, certainly those in Nigeria, they're the ones most open to trading, to um, getting into new ventures, to adopting um, capitalistic ideas and also to be more um, intellectually inclined. Uh, it is a fact that a disproportionate number of um, the uh, Nigerian intellectuals are Igbos, a disproportionate number of their successful businessmen and entrepreneurs are Igbos. So the cultural and development argument then um, uh, emphasizes this fact. And I'm not hostile to that idea. My own view is, yeah, there is some, they may well be, I think culture is important, but in interaction with the environment and the economic opportunities. Uh, in the same way that I, you know, I, I would argue in the case of modern Jamaica, for example, to take an, a, a close parallel, um, while the Chinese so successful uh, relatively in business in Jamaica, um, it's not because they are smarter or anything like that. That, however, they came from a group, you know, um, in 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 China, um, you know, which um, the Hakka, the Hakka speaking group, who were for centuries um, traders, and who 
had a tradition of um, being itinerant traders, moving from one part of China to another. So they, they had a, a well-established culture of, of small-scale trading and, uh, and moving into new environment, even within their uh, Chinese society. And so when they were brought over to Jamaica, they had those institutions, they had those cultural norms and practices, which had been developing for centuries. And they were drawing on that um, to you know, secure capital from among themselves in terms of institutions they had of providing funds um, outside of the banking system um, because no banks would give them, lend them money. They were Chinese uh, coolies to use the um, derogatory term. Uh, they're indentured, uh, but they already had a tradition going back in long ago in China of providing capital from within themselves to something similar to the partner system, but also a tradition of trading. So that's a good cultural parallel. The Chinese success has to do not with the fact that they're smarter, but with the fact that they brought over with them to China, to, to Jamaica from China, from centuries uh, of um, cultural development, a practice which made them very adaptive to filling a gap, which was in the Jamaican economy at the end of the 19th century of small scale trading. Okay. so. I would say um, I'm not going to um, dismiss, and I'm fat would be sympathetic to the idea that um, the Ebers uh, uh, evince a level of individualism and willingness to learn, um, uh, uh, you know, and uh, which um, which may well have made them more um, uh, adaptive um, to the capitalist system here, as it, as they were in Barbados. It's an interesting idea. And uh, people will admit it, you, 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 you phrase your question by saying, you know, um, what do I think of cultural anthropology? Um, and my answer is that uh, people are hostile to explanations of the sort I just gave. I am not, but you have to be very careful with it. You know, um, uh, uh, you know selection factors are important and um, also the opportunity structure economic, political, social, is important in considering cultural factors. Because, for example, to go back to the Chinese, um, the similar groups are taken to Cuba, okay? But the opportunity structure was not as uh, congenial in Cuba as it was in Jamaica. Um, and uh, therefore, the, the Chinese did not succeed commercially in, um, in, in Cuba as they did in Jamaica, nor did they succeed as well in Guyana, which was exactly the same group. They were successful, but not so much commercially, uh, but they more went into educational, professional type activities because the opportunity structure in Guyana was also not there for the Chinese. Why? Because another ethnic group, the Portuguese, who had also been brought in as indentured um, servants to, uh, after slavery to fill the gap, the labor gap. They were there before and they filled that niche. So they took advantage of the opportunity structure before the Chinese did, so they couldn't fill that niche. So the point is that whatever cultural advantage they had, it didn't work for them because the opportunity structure, uh, political, social, economic, was not there. So uh, my bottom line position is culture is important, but it has to be seen interactively with what the opportunity structure is, political, social, and economic. And if that opportunity structure is not there, no matter how um, you know adaptive your cultural resources are, it's not going to work. All right. So Professor Patterson, I'm going to close this interview so we can start part two in a couple of minutes. Okay, very good.